Okay. Well, since Ben Shapiro read my piece, I regret being a slut, I figured it should be out there in my own words and voice because it doesn't doesn't sound quite like me. (laughs) I really just wanted to take a minute, read the piece in my own voice and tell you about the reaction that I've received and tell you about some of the things I've heard and some of the things that have been put on this essay that I don't feel are what I was trying to say at all. So I'm going to read it, which I've never done this before. So we'll see how this goes. I regret being a slut. Upon opening Louise Perry's new book, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, A New Guide to Sex in the 21st Century, I'm moved to tears by the dedication for the women who learned it the hard way. Unlike many other people who have read and reviewed Perry's work, reading her book wouldn't be some academic exercise in contemplating how liberal feminism has let women down. It wouldn't be evaluating what those poor sluts over there have endured in the wake of the sexual revolution. Reading her book was personal. I am one of those sluts. I'm a case study for her thesis, a cautionary tale. I knew this book was going to be difficult, and it made me realize it's time to finish this essay, one I've been trying to write for four years. It's a tough needle to thread. I'm grateful for the ability to control my reproductive cycle and make my own money, but that freedom has come at a price. The dark side of the sexual revolution is that even though it liberated women, unyoking sex from the consequences has primarily benefited men. I was first inspired to write this piece when a 19-year-old woman I used to wait tables with asked me, Bridget... Have you ever regretted having sex with a man? I laughed. Yeah, all of them. That's not entirely true. There was my first love in high school and my first husband. But if I'm honest with myself, of the dozens of men I've been with, at least the ones I remember, I can only think of a handful I don't regret. The rest I would put in the category of casual, which I would define as sex that is either meaningless or mediocre or both. If I get really honest with myself, I'd say most of these usually drunken encounters left me feeling empty and demoralized and worthless. I wouldn't have said that at the time, though. At the time, I would have told you I was liberated, even while I tried to drink away the sick feeling of rejection while my most recent hookup didn't call me back. At the time, I would have said one night stands made me feel emboldened. But in reality, I was using sex like a drug, trying unsuccessfully to fill a hole inside me with men, pun intended. I know regretting most of my sexual encounters is not something a sex-positive feminist who used to write a column for Playboy is supposed to admit. And for years, I didn't. Let me be clear, being a slut and sleeping with a lot of men is not the only behavior I regret. Even more damaging was what I told myself in order to justify the fact that I was disposable to these men. I told myself I didn't care. I didn't care when a man ghosted me. Ugh. Uh, I didn't care when he left in the middle of the night or hinted that he wanted me to leave. The walks of shame, the blackouts, the anxiety. The lie I told myself for decades was, I'm not in pain, I'm empowered. I knew it would be hard to read this. Looking back, it isn't a surprise that I lied to myself because from a young age, sex was something I was lied to about. Long before I ever had sex, I felt ashamed of my natural sexual urges and awkward in my blossoming female body. Growing up Catholic, all I remember about sex was feeling bad about it before I even knew what it was. I only knew that sex before marriage was wrong. Even the thought of a sexual act or masturbation filled me with debilitating guilt. The first time I kissed a boy, I was convinced I'd be punished, struck down by an angry, misogynistic God. As I got older, I was told to guard my virginity. Well-meaning mothers and aunts were clear that I needed to withhold sex in order to get a man to love and respect me. Sex was a commodity, a priceless gem I had to hang on to that increased in value the longer I held it. It made me feel like property, and although I don't think that was the intention of the wise women who had learned their own lessons the hard way, for me, sex became inextricably linked to my self-worth. The shame and guilt I grew up with regarding sex felt oppressive. I resented the double standard that men could be promiscuous and it would raise their status and a woman would be slut-shamed for similar behavior. My burgeoning sexuality would unfold as a reaction to these repressive religious orthodoxies, old-school notions of sexual status, and trauma. 
I lost my virginity at 17 to my boss at a restaurant where I worked. And a year later, I experienced my first sexual trauma. I felt damaged and dirty, and I blamed myself. Everyone responds differently to these situations. I dealt with the overwhelming shame by becoming hypersexual and promiscuous. The culture was right there to pick me up and dust me off. I doubled down on being a proud slut and internalized the biggest and most damaging lie that loveless sex is empowering. I basked in the girl power glow of that delusion for decades, weaponizing my sexuality while convincing myself I was full of the divine feminine. I was full of shit. I told myself that because I could seduce man, I was powerful. But as Perry says in her book, women can all too easily fail to recognize that being desired is not the same thing as being held in high esteem. Deep down inside, I knew that to be the case. But as a defense mechanism, I created a man-eater persona. My mantras were rigid. You can either have a career or a relationship, but you can't have both. Intimacy is creepy. Motherhood and children are a trap. Sex is only about power. Another set of lies built on lies built on trauma. Sex isn't just about power. It's also about intimacy and vulnerability and trust, things I wanted nothing to do with because implicit in modern dating is a complete lack of expectations, especially those of chivalry. Whenever a man wanted to pick up the tab or pull out the chair or open the door or pick me up or take me to dinner or see me during the day or wait longer than the first date to have sex, I was shocked and suspicious of them. Was he a serial killer? Casual sex is fraught with insecurity and miscommunication. Intimacy and love are punchlines. When a man I slept with had the courtesy to reach out, I mistook relief for happiness, rewiring my brain to be grateful for the bare minimum. The saddest realization is how low I set the bar. A lifetime of allowing myself to be the other woman, taken for granted or treated like a doormat under the false pretense of being empowered, came to head one night with the arrival of a text message from an on-again, off-again lover. Good night, baby. I love you, it said, quickly followed by wrong person. Rock bottom doesn't always look like losing everything or ending up in jail. Sometimes it can be that sick feeling in your gut when you know emotionally you're done. I wanted to be able to have meaningless sex like a guy, but it didn't work. After years of writing for Playboy, I've learned it doesn't work for a lot of men either. For years, I tried unsuccessfully not to catch the feels. Even that expression is so telling about the way emotions are viewed regarding relationships, as if they're a cold or a flu or some kind of sickness you need to get over. I'm not speaking for all women. I know many women with a solid sense of self who happily have loveless sex. This piece won't make them defensive. But a lot of women will read this in bristle, just like I did when I used to read something that pushed back on the lie I'd built my entire identity around. Or maybe you're a trans or non-binary person reading this thinking, what quaint ideas about gender and sex this old trad con has? And to that I'll say, it makes sense to me that the generation of young women who have experienced and borne witness to some of the worst side effects of unyoking sex from consequence and love that Perry meticulously outlines in her book, Rough Sex, Hookup Culture, and Ubiquitous Porn, would take a look around and decide, I'd rather be a man. Or more accurately, I'd rather not be a woman. But maybe it's the inevitable conclusion to the sexual revolution. Today's youth are fed an even more dangerous lie than the one that was fed about loveless sex. I was told sex doesn't matter. They're being told biology doesn't matter. This is a tragedy. I'm not suggesting we return to some Victorian era notion of sex or some 1950s era ideal about gender roles. I'm now 43 years old, and I'm in the first truly healthy, intimate relationship in my life with my second husband. We recently had a daughter. And in the wake of her birth, I've been thinking a, a lot about the conversations I'm going to have with her and the conversations I wish I could go back in time and have with young Bridget. I'd tell her, sex can be empowering when you're coming from a position of healthy self-esteem. If you're coming from a place of trauma or insecurity, casual sex won't heal that. In fact, it might set you back and undermine any progress regarding your feelings of self-worth. If you know your value, you're less likely to sleep with someone who doesn't value you. Cherish yourself and you will be cherished. You shouldn't have to withhold sex for a man to respect you. He should respect you regardless. Sexual empowerment has nothing to do with how many people you do or don't sleep with. It has to do with how comfortable you are in your skin, no matter your decision. It's not about waiting until you're in love to have sex. It's about making sure that first you love yourself. 
Don't ignore that nagging gut instinct telling you sexual liberation leaves you feeling unfulfilled. You can still be sex positive and accept that for you, sex can't be liberated from intimacy and a meaningful relationship. I regret being a slut. I regret it because I regret that those men can say they slept with me. Still, that's how I know I finally value myself. Every woman should feel this way. Sleeping with me is a privilege, and you have to be worthy. The reaction to this has been overwhelming. It went huge. It's, as of now, had almost 325,000 views, and that's not including just how much it's sapped everywhere. As I mentioned, Ben Shapiro read it, and it's just made the rounds. And I have been hearing from women, hundreds of women who are writing me. If you're a woman who wants to write me, please reach out. And you can write us at IamPoliticallyHomeless at gmail.com is a good place to reach me with this kind of stuff. And mostly it's women just saying thank you for articulating what I felt or I haven't been able to articulate. I have a good example of this that I've been given permission to read. I know it's a few weeks old, but just because Bridget mentioned in this week's dumpster fire, I will too. Bridget's I regret being a slut essay was seriously a turning point in my evolution as a grown woman. And I don't mean in a small way. It was like an Oprah aha moment for me. Coming both after the long and drawn out breakup of a complicated months long relationship and my 40th birthday, it spoke to me in a way that forced me to admit so many things to myself, not in a shameful way, but in a compassionate way. The first time I read it, I felt it viscerally, so much so that I had to read it several more times to digest it fully. Without knowing it, I was finally facing the things I'd tried so hard not to admit to myself for so long, and it was a lot. I sent it to my therapist even and was like, here, this is both what I feel and what I've been trying to avoid feeling. I've been working on me and my own growth for a few months now and facing that part of myself, the fucked up way I've allowed myself to be treated by men, the men I attract, and the lies I've told myself about how it makes me feel has been a pretty rough but illuminating ride. But I'm so glad I dove into those dark waters. I can't imagine how hard that it was for Bridget to write because I know how hard it was for me to ingest. But I am so thankful. It was like a stepping stone that I needed to trip over and prove myself with before getting up and moving on. Just thought I'd share that. Yet another reason why this place is the shit. By this place, she means Fetacy.com, which is my subscriber community and where this reader posted this. So many emails and so many people have reached out and said that they felt the same way, that they've sent this to their therapist. This is another comment that I hear a lot. And I feel like with Gen X women in particular really relate to this. And it's like they're stumbling back from a war being like, go back. (laughs) It was a lie. It's a trap. It just seems like women who have been sold this kind of uh, millennials too, in particular, the like people who grew up with sex in the city and this idea that we can just have sex with men consequence free and that it doesn't somehow damage our soul. And this is, again, not me speaking for all women. I'm just speaking for myself. And a lot of women have said that they identify with this. And then there's like all the stuff that gets put on a piece like this. I didn't start feeling this way just because I got married and had a kid. A lot of people were like, yeah, everybody feels this way when they get married and have a kid. I wrote the first draft of this in 2017 before I even met my husband. And I have been struggling to finish this because it is a hard piece to thread the needle. As I say, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. There have been so many advances for women that are important, that have come from the sexual revolution, feminism more so than I would say the sexual revolution, but things like being able to control your reproductive cycle and being able to work and earn your own money and not be just oppressed under a system where they feel like second-class citizens is really important. And women have never really been able to make those choices for themselves throughout all of history. I don't want to I don't want to just throw that away because I think that's important and a lot of people will be like see you know feminism as a whole was a mistake and I don't want to throw those women under the bus at all first wave feminists literally died for the cause the right to vote 
and the right to be heard, and they lost their families in some instances. So I don't, I don't want to undermine those women who have fought and come before us. I think the piece that's more important is what's happened in the wake of the sexual revolution. It hasn't been great for men either, by the way. There are so many men who reached out to me and different perspectives from men, how they've seen it affect women in their lives and how that's affected them, how it's affected them as men not knowing the damage they might have been causing in sleeping with a woman who thought she was empowered but wasn't and coming to terms with some of that. I've heard from lots of gay men who felt and identified with the the feelings about promiscuity that I reflect in my piece. One man wrote me, and again, always with permission, I read these. Thanks so much, Bridget, for your column about regret and your shifting perspective on the sexual revolution. My mother had a story much like yours with some variations, including having a son, me, with a front row seat to her many men. She died in November of a prescription drug overdose. Oof. Accidental, probably, after a long history of addiction. But in the months after her death, I've often thought she was, at least in part, also casualty of sorts of the sexual revolution. It's a long, complicated story, but I believe it is one you would deeply understand. I so appreciate your work, your humor, and especially this most recent essay. You helped me understand my mom and remember her with compassion, even as I deplore the cultural lies which contributed to her struggles. I've noticed some cads on Twitter being creeps and just wanted you to know there are men out, men who found your essay meaningful and important. I'm so glad your story will have a different ending than my mother's. I appreciate you, and I'm rooting for you. Congrats on the baby, and God bless. Um, yeah, it could have been me. That, sto- that story affects me because there's a real body count, I think, to this. I, again, can only speak for me in, in the attempts to grapple with the shame that I felt around my sexuality and around all of these confusing issues and ways that I was feeling and then feeling like I didn't have a right to have those feelings because the culture is telling me another thing, go be empowered, rah, rah, this is awesome. Um, I turned to drugs, I turned to alcohol, I tried to escape and I easily could have ended up in a much worse position than I'm in had I not got sober and really looked at a lot of these issues. And then there were the people who felt like I didn't really go far enough. They were like, she's almost there uh, with this idea that you should only have sex within marriage, which is not something I believe or agree with. If that's what you believe and that's what you feel you want to share with your spouse and that's something that is a part of your values, part of your religion— I don't I don't have any problems with that, but I'm not putting that on people either. I just want I want people to be coming from an honest place of what they believe about sex for themselves and not reacting to a culture, not reacting to a religion. So many of the oppressive religions and that system has like messed people's up, heads up about sex too. So I don't think that that is the answer either. And I will say to women out there who feel this on a visceral level that, A, you're not alone. There's thousands of us, literally thousands. B, it's never too late to reclaim that self-worth and that feeling of love for yourself. And it starts with you and it starts by just being honest about those feelings and C, Don't be afraid to share this with a professional who can help you work through a lot of the issues. The problem with so much of this stuff is that you keep doing damage to yourself. At least I did. In in my attempt to keep proving to myself that sex was empowering, that I could have sex like a man, I kept damaging myself, damaging my spirit and soul in ways that I didn't really fully comprehend at the time. I was too young, and I was too high or drunk in many instances. And you can see, when I read the piece, it's still painful, because I wish I knew better. And I guess part of the reason that I wrote this piece is for my daughter. I want her to know better. And for all the young women out there, you don't have to play that game. If you feel in your heart, like, I don't think I can have sex with someone and not get attached and 
I don't know the person and I feel like it's very intimate though. You're right. Those are that that's true. And again, when I said it hasn't been great for men either, it it is simultaneously given men permission to kind of just be these cads and in doing so they're and Louise talks about this in her book, cads versus dads. They're losing out on meeting a woman of substance and they're losing out on having the opportunity to have an intimate relationship and pursue a family and all of these things that come that are so rewarding and fulfilling. And because the women who might feel this way know this about themselves, there are so many good women that I know who are single because how can you compete in the dating world with men who can have sex with as many women as they want if you don't want to have sex with somebody right away. So they're not even engaging in this market of, of you know, mates and dating. That's a tragedy too, because some of the best women I know, smartest, most loving, nurturing women I know are single and not even going on dating sites. Why would you when it's just men generally looking for hookups? So this hookup culture and this way that we've been told is okay has been damaging to everyone. I don't think it's just women who are suffer- suffering the consequences of this. And I think you're going to hear from more women about this. And again, I'm not speaking for all women. There are plenty of women who can have loveless sex and every woman can choose what's right for her. But I think sometimes when you're making that choice, and you are supported by a culture that's telling you sex is just sex or it's all about power or it's all it's unyoking it from the consequences of sex but also unyoking it from your heart which is what I did for so many decades listen to your intuition if you know that about yourself trust yourself And don't avoid those little voices that are saying, maybe this message might be for other people, but it doesn't work for me. If you're doing something that's making you feel bad about yourself, don't keep doing it and hope that it's going to make you feel less bad, which is what I kept doing. I kept thinking I can just fuck my way out of the shame. And that's not what happened at all. I, I ended up making a mess a mess of my my life, but a mess in my own psyche that was really, it's taken me years, years of therapy, years of work. Being in a loving relationship has helped a lot. You know, they say relationships heal a lot of that stuff. I find I have found that to be true. And just accepting that I can forgive myself for a lot of the choices I made. I can forgive myself and have compassion for myself and compassion for that young girl. I was reacting to trauma, reacting to a double standard that drove me crazy, reacting to religious things that I was raised with. And I was in a situation as a young girl where I was a little bit on on my own out there and I did the best that I could with what information I had. And you did too. And you should forgive yourself because that's where um, the the road to healing some of the stuff starts for those women who have written me and told me that they felt very similar. Thank you for writing me. Please keep writing me. I love hearing from you. And thank you for reading it.